Welcome back to Deep in the Heart of Texas 4-H, the official Texas 4-H podcast. This is episode six, and we are talking scholarships today. I am joined by some very special guests today. We have got Bailey Wright and Peyton Branham. How are you guys doing? Great. I'm good. How about y'all? Doing good, doing good. Okay, um, before we go any farther, I just want the two of you to introduce yourself. So, uh, Bailey, you go first, and then Peyton. Sure. As Callie said, my name is Bailey Wright. I work for the Texas 4-H Foundation. My official title is Program Manager, so I get to work on a little bit of everything, but my main focus areas are grants, alumni, and most importantly, scholarships. And so working on scholarships has been really exciting so far. I work with a committee to help develop the application, um, communicate with donors. I'm going to coordinate the judging process, as well as handle awarding the scholarship funds to our scholars once they're in college. So a really neat um, opportunity, and I'm excited to be in this position. Um, like they said, my name is Peyton Branham. I am from Reynolds County in District 7. I graduated from Miles High School this past May, and right now I'm attending Texas Tech. My major is Restaurant, Hotel, and Institutional Management, and I um, plan to get a degree in that, graduate in around four years, and hopefully go on to work in a hotel chain somewhere. Um, I really want to travel. I am a Texas 4-H scholar from this past year. Um, I was a Houston scholar specifically, so that was a wonderful experience overall. I really learned a lot from the experience, and yeah, I'm looking forward to getting to share any tips and tricks I have up my sleeve from this past year. Fantastic. Well, thanks for joining us today, you guys. How's the weather where you guys are? Since you're Since you're both in the same place, (laughs) and I'm the owner over here today. Uh, what's it like up there in Lubbock, America? Um, windy and cold. The wind is what gets you. It's pretty chilly outside. It is pretty chilly. Peyton, I have bad news. The wind is only going to get worse the deeper <laughs> into fall and winter we get. I, I have heard. I've heard that it gets really bad in January and February, so I'm definitely not looking forward to that. Yeah, get a good coat. <laughs> I need to. Oh, goodness. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's brisk here, but it feels really nice (laughs) when you call it too cold. (laughs) Like, I have on a sweater, but I also have on a skirt. So, you know, (laughs) you know, balance. Balance. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yes. Yeah. Like we said, we're talking about scholarships today. um, And that is a huge topic in any organization, um, but really in 4-H, because we have one of the best scholarship programs of any youth organization in the state. Um, And so we have very, very generous donors and we have awesome kids who are deserving of these scholarships. And so we use it as a marketing tactic to parents, right? And to kids Um, join 4-H, do all these programs, have all these experiences. And then maybe at the end of it, get some funding to go to school and achieve your dreams, right? So there's so many ways that scholarships play into the 4-H experience. And do you guys feel that it can maybe be a little bit daunting when you open up that application to start it? Very. from Just from a scholar's perspective, it is a very extensive application. I mean, it's summing up, if you've been doing 4-H since you were in third grade, it's summing up 10 years worth of work. So I could definitely see how it would be, um, and I felt it, how it's very daunting um, and very extensive, but it's all worth it. It really, you you get what you put in, and I really felt that as a scholar. Yeah, and I think um, as a county agent working with parents, I could tell those parents who have had their children enrolled in 4-H since third grade, maybe the child didn't realize when they were in third grade what they were working towards. But even for parents, you know, that's something they've been looking forward to for 10 years. So there's a lot of pressure that comes with it as well. So Bailey, I'm not sure you mentioned it earlier. Tell us about your AgriLife Extension experience before you were the program coordinator for scholarships. Yeah, absolutely. So I started out as a 4-H agent um, in Dallam and Hartley counties, way up 
in the Panhandle in District 1. I was there for three years and loved my time as a 4-H agent. And then I transitioned into a district specialist role. I was a district specialist for five years. Uh, three of those years were in District 1, two of those years in District 2. And then I just transitioned to um, the foundation this summer. But I was lucky to get to judge scholarships a couple of years. And um, this past year, I was the co-chair of the scholarship committee. So we have truly got a wealth of knowledge here regarding 4-H scholarships from <laughs> someone who was an agent, someone who was a district specialist, someone who has judge scholarships, and someone who is now a scholar, went through the whole process and got one of the biggest scholarships. And also Bailey and her now role running the whole show. So all that to say that the things to follow here uh, really can be useful for anyone looking to apply, looking to help their kid apply, an agent helping their kiddos, you know, a district specialist, anything along those lines. We've we've got some good um, good things here for you to keep in mind and resources that we can share with you guys. So what, Bailey, how much did we give away in scholarships this past year? Nearly $2.7 million um, to 229 scholars. And do we think we're going to be around that same number this year? Yeah. Money-wise, I expect us to be right at $2.7 million. As far as um, the amount of scholars we'll award, that does kind of depend on um, the application process, how many apply, where points fall. Also, we have three different categories of scholarships, baccalaureate, courageous heart and technical. So that plays into it as well. But I would expect somewhere around 225 to receive scholarships and that total to be right at 2.7 million. Man, that is just incredible to give that many kids an opportunity. We've got some awesome donors for sure. We sure do. Okay. So we opened up the opportunity to pe for people to ask us some questions for social media. So let's go through some of those questions that were submitted first, and then we'll get into some other tips and tricks. So first things first, when do 4-H Foundation scholarship applications open and when are they due? They opened November 1st, so they're open now. I definitely encourage you if you're a graduating senior wanting to apply for the scholarship to go ahead and set up your profile in that portal and just at least scope out the application now because they are open. They're due February 15th. The portal will shut down at midnight on February 15th. So get those submitted um, by 11.59 p.m. on February 15th. Perfect. And how do you apply? It's all through an online scholarship portal. Um, it's pretty user-friendly, very easy to create an account, and you can find the link to that on the Texas 4-H Foundation website. It's on every single one of our scholarship pages, and it's also in our scholarship guidelines. Um, so it is through an online portal. You can work on your application outside of the portal, most likely in Microsoft Word, and then transfer everything into the portal. And how old do you have to be to apply for this scholarship? You have to be graduating this 2024-2025 um, school year and planning to start college in the fall of 2025. And the final question from social media was the most requested one. What is the committee looking for? Yeah, of course, that's the most requested question. <laughs> um, it's such a tough question to answer. And I'm sure Peyton has some great advice here, too. I'll give you all a pretty basic answer. Um, the components of the scholarship are your 4-H project experiences, your 4-H leadership experiences, community service, um, awards. And then there's a section for outside 4-H experiences, as well as a few narratives. But I guess my biggest piece of advice here aside from gathering all that information and make sure um, you're portraying that information accurately and honestly to the judges is to make sure you're you're giving some personal sentiment to to your application. Uh, these judges are going to judge over 200 applications each. Um, 
And so something that make sure your application has something that's going to really relate to you and make you stick out to them and be memorable and let that judge feel like they got to know you a little bit. I, I definitely agree with that. There are what feels like a million kids um, going for the scholarship. And I definitely feel like something that helps is making yourself memorable. Like Bailey said, um, they're reviewing every single one of those kids. So having something that's personal to you that will be personal to them as well um, for them to remember you by is very helpful. I remember um, especially in the interview when you're face to face with judges and you can talk about you know, answering the questions, but you also have some personal, you know, uh, space to talk about what you would like. Um, it's really important to show your personality, especially if they ask you a personality question. Um, really just portraying who you are, um, it really helps and may helps them feel a personal connection to you. So Peyton, you just mentioned an interview there. Walk us through the process from point A to point B and just the whole experience of um, just the whole process of becoming a foundation scholar. Well, um, I worked on my application for many, many months, it felt like at least, um, and submitted it. I was then invited to um, have an interview with a set of judges. The interview itself lasts 10 minutes and they I can ask you, you know, as many questions as needed or as time allows. Um, most of the questions are related to your 4-H experience and your, you know, your accomplishments and your experience as a leader and the many different things you've done within 4-H. But they can also throw in a personality question or something that might feel random, but is supposed to show you show them who you are as a person. Um, for me personally, my personality question was if I was an ice cream flavor, what would I be? which seems really odd, but it, it definitely gives them the chance to see who you are, as well as not in a such a professional setting. You know, you're answering all of these questions and you're trying to do it as professional and as efficient as possible, but breaking the ice with something, a personality question really, you know, calms you down and also, you know, brings you back to the moment. This is just an interview. It may feel like there's a lot riding on this and there is, but it's not, you know, this isn't, the end all of everything. But um, yes, so I would definitely say the interview was for me personally, a more stressful process than the application itself. I felt <laughs> much more nervous for the interview. But once it was over, I realized that it wasn't as stressful as it seemed. And I didn't have to <laughs> freak out as much as I did. But um, I realized that, you know, they've already seen my application. And this is my chance to really show them who I am and make that personal connection. Okay, so what ice cream flavor were you? <laughs> <laughs> I am having a, I think I said I was a raspberry sorbet, um, something <laughs> along those lines. <laughs> I am not a big ice cream, like a cream uh, person. I prefer a sorbet over an ice cream, which may seem odd, but you know, that's who I am. So I, I showed them who I was. And I also just really enjoy raspberry. So that's kind of where I fell on that <laughs> question. Spoken like a true food and nutrition girly. <laughs> indeed. I was indeed. thinking the same thing. She chose a healthy <laughs> choice, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I did. Um, okay. Well, so you, you mentioned that that interview was kind of scary, um, as it likely will be for most. How would a youth go about preparing for that interview? From a scholar's perspective, I would say... A mock interview is your best friend. Um, no matter who it is, practicing with as many people as you can definitely helps. Um, my dad had my parents, both of them were very, um, very clear on their desire that I practice with as many people as possible because you know, the questions may be the same coming from a person if they have a set list of questions that have been asked previously. For example, my county agent. Um, one of my county agents, he has a list of questions that he collects after every interview, you know, just to from the kids to have a just general list of things that he can, you know, practice with the kids. And um, I interviewed with him and he's a very, very serious guy, if you know him and, um, you know, <laughs> so um, him asking me those questions and 
practicing with him was a much different experience than I had with any anyone else. So, you know, even if it's the same set of questions, having the person asking the questions be different each time is very important. You know, you're never going to, you know, they might be seeing something different in your interview um, that someone else might. And so just getting as many different perspectives as possible was very crucial to my practicing for the interview pro uh, interview session. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with Peyton on mock interviews. I think the more you do it, the more comfortable you are with it. Callie, I do just want to take a moment to say a couple things about the interview process because I think there's this like, I don't know, mysterious vibe about the interview process, but I don't want it to be mysterious for anyone. I want everyone to um, who gets invited to the interview process to feel like they know what to expect. So is it okay if I just take a couple minutes here? Yeah, absolutely. And so I can't speak to every year in the future how it's going to be, but I can definitely tell you what it's going to be like this year. And this is how it's been the past several years. Uh, we'll have three different interview rooms. There's kind of um, rumors that float around like, oh, you're assigned certain interview rooms off of how your application ranked. That's not true for our scholarship process. If you're invited to interview, you have a form where you fill out exactly what time slots you want. And so your rooms are assigned strictly off of the time slots. Um, it's very random. There's three judges per room. Two of those judges will be um, 4-H youth development professionals, so either district specialists or county extension agents. And one of those judges in the room is a Texas 4-H Foundation board member. So maybe that just gives you a little bit of an idea of who you're interviewing with. Um, they're always very nice people. All of our agents and district specialists are nice people as well as our board members. So I know this is easier said than done, but maybe that takes a little bit of, of the nerves out of the equation. Um, they're all excited to be there and interview our scholars. Uh, so I just wanted to let people know that, that that's who's in the room. That's how the three different rooms work. It's all based on how you sign up. Um, when you get there, you go into a holding room, which usually Dr. Williams, our Texas 4-H program leader, is in the holding room trying to just um, ease some nerves, get to know you, have some conversations with you before you're walked to your interview room. Uh, like Peyton said, you have 10 minutes with your judges, and our judges are pretty consistent about using the full 10 minutes. They want to learn as much about you as they can. Um, last year, I was a timekeeper, and on average, they were going nine and a half minutes to 10 minutes. Um, and so if your interview gets cut off at 10 minutes, it's not a bad thing. That's happening to a lot of people. But we are really strict about cutting the interview off at 10 minutes just to keep it fair across the board. Um, so those are just a few things that I wanted to make sure we're clear about the interview process. I think that's so helpful. And like you said, if it's less mysterious, maybe it's a little less scary for the kids that are walking into that room or the parents that are trying to, you know, hype up their kids that are about to walk yeah. into that room. I can tell them exactly what's going to happen. So I think that's super, super helpful. Um, speaking on kind of the parent side or, you know, um, also as an agent, what do you think is the best way to support the kiddos applying for these scholarships? Yeah, from my perspective, it would be to almost create a timeline with um, your child, your 4-H member who's applying, because I think the one thing you don't want to do in this process is get behind and feel like you're um, in a crunch at the last minute. So I think as a county agent, something I tried to do and that I learned from other county agents who were my mentor was to kind of set deadlines with those 4-H members that I was working with. Like, okay, by um, December 1st, let's maybe have some of your, your charts, if that's the route you're going, or those sections worked out. By January 1st, I want you to have all of your narratives done so we can read through that. Just maybe a little bit of a timeline with goals there to stay on track. Um, absolutely start early, start now, get your game plan going there. And I think just supporting them in that way, from my perspective, is really important, as well as be in communication with your county extension agent. They, even if they're new, we've offered several training opportunities that I'm sure they've taken advantage of, whether it be on the state level or the district level. 
I really encourage all of our applicants to loop your county agent in from the beginning. Um, Peyton hit on this on how important it was to her to have both of her county agents involved in their advice. They want to help you, and I think they'll have really great advice for you. Also new this year, there is a county extension agent verification form. Um, that It's a requirement that you have that form. Your county agent will want to see your scholarship application before they sign that form. And so I also think it's really important to talk to them in the beginning of the process and make sure you know their schedule because unfortunately, February 15th is right in the middle of major stock show season. You want to make sure you have a date time set to meet with them to get that form signed as well. Um, another thing before I turn it over to Peyton on this question, if your district specialist or someone at the district level is offering a district scholarship training, I would absolutely attend that as well. I completely agree with Bailey. Um, your county agents are one of your biggest resources as a 4-H'er and especially as a scholar. I know from personal experience, having your county agents there for you is just a wonderful, wonderful resource. Um, even if you're a nutrition kid, I highly suggest you have your um, livestock 4-H extension agent, you know, go over your application with you and give any feedback, as well as if you're a livestock kid, you have your FCS agent, um, go over it. Um, it's, but it's very important that, you know, every, very many different perspectives see the application and can give feedback. You know, they might see something that the other doesn't or that you don't. Um, I also agree that if your district is having a 4-H um, workshop, 4-H scholarship workshop. I highly suggest going to that. It's great information. It's gold practically in this setting. And um, having, like I've said many times, having as many different perspectives at your um, fingertips is just a wonderful and probably one of the most important things about um, making sure you, you know, going through this scholarship application process. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with you guys as well. Um, and I think that that Probably, you know, uh, people have used that tactic for other scholarships as well. So a lot of the things we're talking about here, these seniors are going to be using in multiple ways. So um, one thing we've mentioned, you know, utilize your agent. Maybe we have a brand new agent listening to this and they are a little overwhelmed with exactly <laughs> how they're supposed to support their kids. Are there resources or should they just reach out to you, Bailey? Should they ask another agent? What would you suggest to that brand new agent who wants to be a good resource for their kiddos, but they're just not really sure how to? Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for asking that, Callie. All of the above. Feel free to reach out to me personally. I, I would be glad to visit with you. Also, I would definitely say reach out to your district specialist. Um, most of them have been in their positions for several years and are experienced in scholarships on some level or another. But you can also always visit the Texas 4-H Foundation website. I know I'm giving lots of shameless plugs for that. But I'm really excited that we have several new resources this year one of those um, being we kind of revamped our guidelines. So I would print those off if I were a new agent and read through them, make notes. If you have questions, um, call your agent mentor, call your district specialist, call me. I'm glad to chat with you through any questions you have after reading those guidelines. There's also a training that we just did a couple weeks ago that was specifically for county extension agents. It's not posted on our website just because it's it's an agent resource. And so if you don't have that from me in an email, feel free to email me that and I'll, I'll send you that recording. But please don't be afraid to reach out and ask questions directly. I want all of our agents and district specialists to feel like they're prepared in the scholarship process to help their 4-H members. Awesome. All right. So Peyton, you mentioned that you uh, are a Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo Scholar. What would you like to say to those scholars? And also, how is this going to benefit you in the long run? I would say that um, kind of I've hit on it just a little bit, but you get what you put into the application process and the interview process as a whole. Um, if you are willing to put in the work and dedicate yourself to this application, you will um, 
you know, you will reap what you sow. And so I would say um, to everyone that's, you know, trying for the Houston Scholar or that's what their goal is, I would say that is um, extremely worth the effort. And uh, for anyone who is considering, you know, what the benefits of the scholarship will be, I would say that, you know, it's in the title in itself, getting to say that I'm a Houston Scholarship is a, you know, a Houston Scholar is just a wonderful achievement in itself. And I also am reaping the benefits, of course, this is, it's um, helping me support my, you know, financially supporting me on my journey throughout college. And it will, being a Houston Scholarship Scholar, but also getting to show what I've done with it is just a wonderful achievement. That's awesome, Peyton. Uh, so, you know, we have Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo. They provide millions of scholarships every year, right? But we also have a ton of families or individuals or smaller groups who provide scholarships. And we are just as grateful for those as we are for Houston Live Stock Show and Rodeo, San Antonio Stock Show and Rodeo. So um, we just want to take a moment to thank all of our donors for giving their funds to these 4-Hers um, and benefiting them for years to come, not just during their their time in college. So um, Bailey, if someone wanted to maybe start a scholarship in honor, in memory, just because, um, how would someone go about sponsoring a scholarship in the future? Yeah, absolutely. Um, of course, you. there's a form on our website, but if that feels a little impersonal, uh, at my, can I start over, Callie? Yep, sure can. Thanks, thanks. There is a form on our website for people who are interested in becoming scholarship donors. But if that feels a little impersonal, you can also find my email on our website and we can set up a Zoom call. I can come see you. We can have coffee. We can talk on the phone. We can email back and forth and talk about the potential of becoming a scholarship donor. Whatever conversation you would like to have about that, I am more than willing to have that conversation uh, and like Callie said, maybe this is organizations who want to become a donor, businesses, or individuals. Uh, we're open to all of the above. Our scholarships range anywhere from $5,000 up to this year, and I know we'll talk about this here in just a little bit, $30,000. So there's a broad range in there. Um, I'm sure we can find a fit for you. And Callie already thanked our donors, but of course, I would like to do the same Um it's so impactful for our scholars, and I feel so lucky that I'm privy to read each uh, semester our our current scholarship recipients send an update letter to their donors, and they send me a copy as well. Uh, and to read those and to know truly the difference that these funds are making in their college career, it's allowing them to spend more time focusing on their academics. It's allowing them to take opportunities and be involved in on-campus organizations and internships and study abroad and get incredible experiences. And one thing in common that all of our scholars I've noticed in those those um, letters that they're writing semesterly, they talk about how excited they are for their careers and ways that they're going to give back not only to their communities, but the 4-H program as a whole. And so I think that's just really encouraging. And I'm so thankful that our donors are allowing that to happen. Absolutely. So you teed it up just perfectly where we were going next. You mentioned a pretty big number and a new scholarship. Tell me what you meant. We are so excited about this. Um, the Texas 4-H Foundation Board voted this summer that we will give one thirty thousand dollars scholarship, which is really exciting to introduce that that new big number, like you said, Callie. And so this will be our first year to do it, and it'll be a little bit of a different, not a different, a new process for this thirty thousand dollars scholarship. So we'll invite back a group um, to interview, like normal interview weekend. After that, of course, we have points from the application and points from the interview. And we'll do a ranking of our scholars. Um, and we'll find that top group where there's kind of a natural break in points and invite them back for a second round of interviews. It will be virtual because we know it's really tough 
on graduating seniors early May. Y'all have lots of things going on. Um, and it would be hard for us to ask you to come back to College Station the very next weekend. So we'll do a virtual interview with our um, top ranking group of potential scholars. Uh, they'll have an interview with a new set of judges who didn't interview them in the first round. And then after those interviews, we will award one thirty thousand dollar scholarship based on that. Um, and yeah, we're really excited for that. We think that's the direction that our program is moving, and we hope to see more thirty thousand dollar scholarships in the future. That is so cool. I just think it's it's so awesome that you're able to give that level of scholarship to you know a really deserving kiddo. So I think that's incredible. Well, ladies, I think that we have hit a lot of points here on our scholarships. Um, and I know Peyton has a couple of tips waiting for us. Is there anything else that you guys think folks might need to know? I have one thing, Callie, that popped into my head as we've been talking. Um, it's a little random, so I'm sorry. Callie may never invite me back for another <laughs> podcast. <laughs> but... Always really. <laughs> thanks. Thanks. But I think we get caught up, or scholars, parents, county extension agents, district specialists, all of us can get caught up when we're working on these applications of making sure we list everything. We want to make sure we put as many project experiences as we can in there. We want to make sure we fill up and do all the leadership experiences we can, et cetera. And that is great. I, I agree with you. You want to get all the important stuff in there. But something that I hope you don't lose focus on and that I think is equally as important to our judges. They want to know what you did, absolutely. But they also want to know what you got from that. Um, the knowledge you learned, the skills you gained, the impact it had on you. If you were in a leadership position, the impact you had on others. So I would just encourage you not to lose focus on that aspect of it too. Make sure you're also portraying what you learned, what you gained from it, and the impact of your experiences in addition to just what you did. Perfect. I think that's a great tip for people to keep in mind as they enter into the scholarship process. And reminder, these are currently open. So go ahead and get started today. Don't wait until the last minute. Absolutely don't wait. Get started early. So before we get into our top 4-H tip of the day, we have Giving Tuesday coming up. If you've never heard of Giving Tuesday, it is an opportunity for you to give to, um, you know, whatever it is that you you care about. And so um, it's at the end of the year. So this year, Giving Tuesday is on December 3rd, and the 4-H Foundation has a campaign running. Um, so from now until December 3rd, Bailey, can you tell us what the Foundation's Giving Tuesday campaign is this year? Yes, our goal is to raise $10,000 between now and December 3rd. Like Callie said, $10,000 um, is equivalent to two $5,000 scholarships. And so we'd love to be able to, before the new year, say that we already have two of those scholarships funded. So we're really excited to be able to do that. I also have an exciting announcement we're already 25% of the way to that goal. So we're really um, happy about that. And that makes us feel really confident that we're going to be able to reach that $10,000 goal by December 3rd and fund two scholarships for two, I'm sure, very deserving 4-H members. Fantastic. So yeah, y'all help us out with reaching that goal for giving Tuesday, little play on words, or help us, you know, share it with others who might want to um, help support that as well. We also have our Christmas sock store open. It opened on uh, December 7th. And so you can go in and purchase some fun 4-H socks. We have the winning design from our Christmas sock design contest there. Um, so go in and purchase your Christmas socks. Great stocking stuffer ideas. Uh, so don't miss out on that opportunity. All right. Well, Peyton, like I said, at the end of every episode, we do a top 4-H tip. And I believe you've got that for us today. I do. Um, so I have just a couple of smaller tips that I would like to share. The first is that um, many people find, and I 
myself, I did as well, find our record books from the past to be a very helpful resource. You can go through and if you completed one in the past, you can see all of the awards and the community service you completed for that year as well as the years before. Um, but even if you do not have a record book at your um for your use you might take a trip down your mom's facebook history um you know our parents are always cataloging everything that we do and so if your mom is like mine and posts just about everything about our lives on facebook you can take a trip down her facebook page and maybe you will find some um, community service projects that you did or some smaller awards that you achieved and you can use those within your application um, in addition, I also just want to hit on using both of your county extension agents, like I said earlier, and also kind of how Bailey said, making sure to follow all deadlines given to you by your county extension agents. Um, they are a wonderful resource, but you have to, you know, if you're expecting them to help you, you have to, you know, respect them and everything that they're giving you. So I would just say, you know, using your record book as well as your county extension agents. Overall, just using any resources you have at your fingertips and making sure to utilize those to their full potential. Look at that. Mama's Facebook coming in handy. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, ladies, for joining us today and giving us so much wisdom. We really appreciated you guys being on. And to our listeners, thanks for joining us again. We'll see you next time.